Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Christopher Padgett. I'm the president of the Kentucky Genealogical Society. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's uh, program. This is an author talk uh, with Lynn Pohl, who uh, has published a wonderful book on the history of Waverly Hills, which is uh, one of the um, uh, tuberculosis institutions mm -hmm. in Kentucky. Uh, so to you know, there was a broad Kentucky ecosystem of institutions. Tonight, we're gonna to be focusing on one of them. And um, these are important to learn about because if you had uh, an ancestor or someone you're researching in one of these places, it's really important to know the historical context for um, their lives and what they were experiencing. So tonight, we're gonna to go deep into uh, one institution in Jefferson County, which is Waverly Hills. And i um, so excited we have Lynn joining us. Um, I was just um, sharing with my two wonderful co-hosts who I wanna welcome, Melissa, welcome. Hello, Christopher, great to be here. I'm looking forward to this talk, actually. Uh, Melissa is uh, on our board of directors and she is also the archivist for Houston County, Tennessee. And so we're real excited that she co-hosts these with us. And then we also have with us Elizabeth Allen Pennebaker from Burlington, Vermont. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hi there. Welcome from the hello from the frozen north. <laughs> Getting a foot of snow tonight. Thank oh. you both for, for co-hosting tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, just so you all know how this program came about, um, I was just sharing uh, before we got started. I have about uh, I don't know, ten or twelve family members, cousins, great grand aunts, uncles who. Um, sadly passed away while in Waverly Hills because of the tuberculosis they had. And so when I heard this book came out um, a little while back, I was like, I've got to find out who that author is and get them to come talk to the society. And uh, put that kind of on my, in the back burner. And then about a month or two later, I was reading something and it said, author Lynn Pohl uh, wrote this book about Waverly Hills. And I thought, oh, fascinating. Lynn is one of my neighbors. So uh, <laughs> I was just sharing, I could throw a rock and hit her house if I wanted to. <laughs> so um, I invited her to come talk to us and she said yes. And so we're so glad that she's here. Uh, before we get started, I have just a little bit of housekeeping. And here's Lynn um, now. This is a photo I snagged off the Pilsen Historical Society website. Uh, we have our inclusion statement, which just says that regardless of who you are, where you're from, you're welcome. And uh, we're really glad that you're participating this evening. Tonight's program is being recorded. There is no handout uh, to answer those questions. Uh, we also always share our land acknowledgement, which um, just acknowledges the place we call present day Kentucky as historically indigenous homeland that belong primarily to a number of Native American uh, peoples, including the Cherokee and Shawnee, before European settlement. And then finally, we share that uh, the contents of tonight's program, as well as the thoughts and views and opinions expressed, belong to the presenter and host and do not reflect the views of the society. The society does not endorse any researcher, speaker, method, product, or record repository. And depending upon the circumstances of your research, there may be risk involved in the research process and the society is not responsible for your choices, errors, conduct, or outcomes. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to introduce Lynn. And while I'm doing that, Lynn, I'm going to send you over the um, the slides. So, okay. Well, I'm going to introduce Lynn. Lynn Pohl holds a BS in history from Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi, and an MA and PhD in history from Indiana University Bloomington. She has taught history at Indiana University and colleges in Asheville, North Carolina, and Louisville, Kentucky. She moved with her family to Louisville in 2006 to live in the same neighborhood as her sister, and she hopes to remain in her adopted hometown for many years to come. She has worked at the Filson Historical Society since 2018. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn. Thank you. Um, uh, everyone can see my screen okay? Yes, we can see it just fine. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, and thanks to everyone for being here tonight. Uh, I want to focus tonight on the stories of people connected to Waverly Hill Sanatorium, those who supported the public institution that opened in 1910 for the treatment of tuberculosis, those who are patients there and those who work there. At the end of my talk, I'm happy to field any questions about the history of Waverly Hills, 
as well as about any sources that might be useful to those trying to find information about family members who were treated there or who worked there. Uh, this is especially important in light of the fact that uh, apparently no patient or administrative records for Waverly Hills still exist. Uh, many of Waverly Hills records were destroyed in the flood of 1937 when they were stored downtown. Um, and other records apparently were destroyed when the institution closed in 1961. So my research into Waverly Hills began in early 2019 when the Filson Historical Society here in Louisville received a remarkable collection of over 150 photographs of patients and employees at the institution during the 1920s. They were donated by the grandson of Edward Arthur, who uh, is pictured here. Edward Arthur was a business manager at Waverly Hills in the 1920s. Uh, he was also a patient who died there in 1929. So these are just a few of the pictures and we'll see more of them later, a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, Edward is the one here on the left in the string band. He's the one with the bow in the back. And then he's here on the right with his family, his wife, Anna, and his two young children. And this photo on the right was taken just about uh, six months before he died at Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Um, if you search online uh, for information about Waverly Hills, you're bound to find mostly websites Highlight, highlighting ghost stories, uh, the so-called death tunnel, and the sanatorium's reputation as the most haunted place on earth. It was clear to me uh, that there was a need for a documented history of the institution. And once I started looking, I was surprised by the number of resources I was able to find, ranging from newspaper articles to public health reports and records, uh, Board of Health Minutes, and then a lot of personal accounts and re recollections. Uh, my intent in this talk, as well as in my book, is to look at both individual struggles and broader medical and social developments, uh, to uncover a history that was, was very distressing, uh, but also quite dynamic, shaped by significant uh, changes over time. So we're gonna begin in the early 20th century when tuberculosis ranked as the number one cause of death in Louisville, as well as in many other cities across the United States. Just a few decades earlier in 1882, the German physician Robert Koch had identified a specific bacterium as the cause of tuberculosis. Uh, this was a groundbreaking discovery that helped show how certain diseases were caused by specific microscopic germs. Uh, the disease tuberculosis had been a major killer throughout the 19th century. Uh, it most commonly affected the lungs, but it could also infect many other parts of the body. And it had been known by many names through the centuries. Uh, many people believed it to be hereditary during the 19th century. Koch's discovery showed that tuberculosis was a contagious disease spread through the spit or the sputum of those with active cases. Now, his discovery provided the microscopic means to help diagnose the disease and new knowledge about how to control its spread. So here in Jefferson County, uh, the Louisville Anti-Tuberculosis Association was formed in 1905. Uh, later, in later decades, by the early 1920s, it would be renamed the Louisville Tuberculosis Association. So don't get confused when I refer to it as that later in the presentation. Uh, this was a primarily uh, educational organization, which wanted to um, teach people about germs and contagion, uh, which were still very new concept to people in the early 20th century. So here on the right uh, is one of, its, one of the Louisville Tuberculosis Association's graphs showing how tuberculosis was infectious and how it could spread from person to person. Uh, early 20th century campaigns tried to teach new health habits to people. Uh, they asked people to stop spitting in public, to stop sharing cups, uh, to start opening their windows, start washing their hands, and to consult a physician if they had a persistent cough. 
Uh, however, the Louisville Anti-Tuberculosis Association, in addition to its educational campaigns, also helped to uh, establish two sanatoriums in Jefferson County. Uh, the first was Hazelwood Sanatorium, which was located just north of what is now Iroquois Park and was established in 1907. Uh, this is a private institution at the time. Uh, the other institution would be the public Waverly Hill Sanatorium, which would be established in 1910. Uh, people at the time saw sanatoriums as both preventative and curative. Uh, sanatoriums isolated tuberculosis patients from the public and highly regulated institutions uh, where patients were provided fresh air, a lot of rest, hearty food and nursing care. And all of these were supposed to help strengthen patients' natural defenses to overcome the bacterial infection in their lungs. Uh, so the Board of Tuberculosis Association, as you can see here on this chart, uh, this was the independent board set up to administer, again, what would become Waverly Hills Sanatorium. And Waverly Hills was going to be a public sanatorium funded by new county and city taxes. And it was meant to provide free, uh, both free board and treatment to residents of Louisville and Jefferson County. In early 1908, the Board of Tuberculosis Association purchased the Waverly Hill property of Major Thomas Hayes and Georgia Hayes, uh, located in the southwest part of Jefferson County. So here is the home um, of the Hayes family, and their land would provide both um, the property uh, for the new sanatorium as well as its name. Uh, the Board of Tuberculosis Hospital hired Louisville architect J.J. Gaffney to design the original buildings of Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Uh, here we see in this uh, picture the main sanatorium building or the main administrative administration building as it was called in the center. And this building was flanked on each side with a pavilion, a screen pavilion, uh, which had bathrooms and dressing rooms on the inside. At its opening in 1910, uh, there were 40 beds available for white male and white female patients um, on, and only patients with early cases of tuberculosis. Uh, in the following months and years, however, the number and the types of patients admitted to the sanatorium and the number of buildings and beds at Waverly Hills would expand rapidly. Uh, here's a photo from that Edward Arthur photograph collection I was talking about. This is of uh, the inside of one of those pavilion, of the pavilion for male patients. You can see uh, how bored these patients are looking in this photo. Um, another popular location for photos um, in this collection are on the playground equipment in front of the children's pavilion. Uh, the Children's Pavilion opened right next to the Women's Pavilion in 1916, and it was made available to white children, either who had tuberculosis or more commonly uh, children whose parents were at the sanatorium. Uh, Waverly Hills also would provided formal schooling to those children. Um, here's another building that was added uh, to this growing complex in the 19 teens. Uh, this is the Hospital for Advanced Cases at Waverly Hills that opened in January 1913. Uh, this was located about a quarter of a mile downhill from that original administration building and pavilions that we just saw pictures of. Uh, it had four wards uh, with porches on each side, and we can see the porches on each end of this building in this picture. Uh, there was one ward each for black females, black males, white females, and white males. Uh, the history of this building is long. Uh, during the 45 years that it housed patients and later employees, uh, the building was part of a separate world at Waverly Hills. Uh, two years after opening with 50 beds, over 100 patients were housed at the hospital. Uh, so imagine these photos of one of the porches and one of the wards with more than three times as many patients and beds in them. 
Death rates among the hospitals, advanced cases of tuberculosis were distressingly high. Around a third of those admitted to the hospital in the first several years had died there. In the two wards for black patients, uh, children and adults, as well as early and advanced cases of tuberculosis uh, were mixed up together uh, because black patients were excluded from those original pavilions as well as from the children's pavilion. Uh, the wooden uh, building was considered a fire trap by the end of the decade and its miserably crowded conditions with one bathroom for every 25 patients became a key argument for the construction of a new sanatorium building in the early 1920s. Uh, this is that new building. Uh, this is the building that still stands today. And it opened in 1926, um, right next to the original administration building. Uh, this structure was truly monumental in a number of ways. First of all, First of all was its cost of $1 million, 750,000 of which came from a municipal bond passed almost unanimously by voters on election day in November, 1922. So a little over a hundred years ago. Uh, there was a striking Tudor Gothic revival design by Arthur Loomis uh, with assistance from the architectural firm of DX Murphy. Uh, there was its size of 400 beds with state-of-the-art facilities and amenities, including a laboratory, new surgical rooms, a barber shop, a beauty shop, a movie theater, a chapel, a library, um, and semi-private rooms that opened up to long communal sun porches on the south side of the building, as we can see here. Uh, the building also had its own dedicated space for occupational therapy. Uh, this is one of my favorite photos in the Filson documentary, Waverly Hills. It's of a Waverly Hills sanatorium booth at the state fair, and it's displaying goods made by patients in the occupational therapy program. Uh, so patients would work on embroidery, they'd work on sewing projects, they could work on painting projects, um, or even woodworking projects. Often these uh, goods would be sold to the public and the public would be assured that all items had been thoroughly sanitized. The new sanatorium building also host, regularly hosted social events for patients in the building, um, including the famous Halloween party every year and the election of the King and Queen of Waverly Hills Sanatorium. So I love in these photos, I love Queen Juanita's dress in the left, uh, in this photo on the left from 1928. And I'm very impressed by the um, royal attire and makeup on the right in this photo from 1929. Uh, these amazing photos were tucked into uh, the diaries of James Gabhart, who was from Henderson County, Kentucky. And he moved to Louisville and we think in early 1920s, probably around 1924 or 1923, uh, at the age of 23 with his wife, Mary, soon after he was diagnosed with tuberculosis. In three diaries from 1928 to 1931, James chronicles his time at Waverly Hills. He provides a daily account of what life was like for a seriously ill patient at the new sanatorium. Uh, one interesting fact about these diaries is that they were just accessioned by the Filson Historical Society this past fall, unfortunately after the publication of my book in June. I was sorry not to draw on them for my book, but it is amazing to think of all the architectural gems, or I'm sorry, all the archival gems still out there, hopefully to become publicly available one day. So I want to spend a bit of time talking about what James writes about in his diaries. He writes from room number 361, uh, likely one of the private rooms located on the north side of the new sanatorium building reserved for the sickest patients. He often writes usually every Sunday and if you can see the screen here you might be able to make out his entry 
on Sunday, December 14th in the top left part of this uh, slide. He writes about visits on Sunday from his wife, Mary, who is an accountant, and she sometimes bring their young, brings their young daughter, Martha Lilly, who was four years old in 1928. So she's six here in this uh, diary in 1930. And he calls his wife Toots. So if, that, if you're trying to make out the writing, Toots is his wife. Uh, in an early entry, an earlier diary, he writes of Sunday evenings after visitors have gone. And he says, quote, things quiet with a stillness that is almost unbearable. Everybody has his thoughts and they are all thoughts of home. It is no easy job to stand at a window and watch your loved ones leave week after week for months and months, unquote. His sentiment is echoed by many patients at Waverly Hills through the years. Uh, James writes about passing the days alone and sometimes with other patients. In the summer of 1929, he writes about playing backgammon with another patient on his floor when a group of younger patients started throwing grapes at each other. Now that group hit a patient reading who got mad and threw a glass bottle at the bunch. That glass bottle hit James knee and according to him broke into a thousand pieces. Uh, he had an injured knee he had to deal with for the next several weeks. James is only 31 years old at this time, but he often complains about the noise of younger patients on the third floor. And he occasionally reports their card playing if he thinks it's involving betting. Uh, he writes about their quote, vice den, unquote. For Christmas in 1929, James writes about the American Legion giving each ex-serviceman, and James himself is a World War I veteran, so giving each ex-serviceman a basket of candy, nuts, apples, oranges, and several packs of cigarettes. It was strictly against the rules at Waverly Hills to have cigarettes, so just a few minutes later, the nurse supervisor of the third floor, Ann Fitzgibbons, came through with a big basket to collect all the cigarettes. Many patients did not want to give them up, James wrote, but that made no difference. Uh, here on the bottom right um, of your screen in the entry on Saturday, December 20th, he's writing about the time that a farm laborer outside his window was digging up some dirt and found a mole. Um, and again, if you can make out what he's writing about in this entry, he says he lets down a cord string and the worker tied the mole to the string so that James could pull it up through his window into his room. He said he played with it, but then got tired of it and gave it away. So it wasn't a good day for the mole, uh, but it's a good example of how patients at Waverly Hills were just desperately trying to pass the time and occupy themselves. James often also writes about his symptoms and about his interaction with nurses and physicians. In 1928, he starts coughing up blood. He is diagnosed with a tubercular larynx and is told by physicians to try to refrain from talking so that he can rest his throat. He receives alpine light lamp treatment uh, using ultraviolet light on his throat. Now, he later suffers burns from the lamp in the summer of 1929. Uh, earlier in the year, physicians cauterized James' throat with an electric needle and removed two ulcers. At this point, his cough is so violent that it is causing vomiting. His cough is treated with hypodermic injections of codeine. James writes in his diary, quote, I don't like to be taking so much codeine. It is a child of morphine, unquote. He starts noting how many hypodermic injections of codeine he receives in red ink. So the red markings and notations here on this page are him noting when he's receiving a coding injection. And he receives as many as 150 a month. One big concern of patients diagnosed with tuberculosis is dramatic weight loss caused by a lack of appetite, nausea, and abdominal pain. In 1930, James convinces his physician to let him take eggnog every day instead of the daily dose of tomato ju juice and cod liver oil uh, that he dreaded every day. 
Uh, James does not write about undergoing any surgical procedures other than the cauterization of his throat. He notes how a few other patients undergo lung collapse therapies, such as pneumothorax, uh, which involved the injection of air into the chest cavity to temporarily, temporarily collapse uh, the diseased lung, thus giving it a chance to heal. Um, another form of lung collapse therapy was thoracoplasty, which involved the removal of a certain number of ribs uh, to permanently collapse the diseased lung. The patients who underwent the more radical procedure of thoracoplasty went to St. Anthony's Hospital and Norton's infirmary, infirmary for that surgery. Uh, one of the patients, James notes, died about six months later. Uh, James also writes about his visits home from the sanatorium. Uh, here you can see one of the passes uh, he received, an official pass, so that he could go home. When he first earns an official pass, and this is during Thanksgiving um, earlier in 1928, it is the first time in 14 months that he is able to go home. In future months and years, he goes home more frequently, earning passes for Christmas, Easter, 4th of July, as well as Thanksgiving. When at home, uh, surprisingly, he is often out and about. He goes to the insurance company, to the bank, to the dentist, to the store to buy a new coat, uh, to the walnut cafeteria with his family. And he almost always stays more, he stays at home more days than allotted on his official pass. When he gets sick at home or when he feels like he is becoming a burden on his family, he writes of wanting to return the Waverly Hills to rest. In the fall of 1930, uh, things really start to decline for James. James writes that his physician at Waverly Hills at the time, Dr. Fisher, thinks he is, quote, a dead man and I know I am, unquote. He goes home for Christmas. As the net economic crisis of the Great Depression worsens, his wife Mary finds out that she has been laid off from her job as an accountant with LNN Railroad. In early 1931, James is back at Waverly Hills. His health continues to decline and so does his relationship with his wife, though she continues to visit weekly. He leaves the sanatorium for home in May and all the nurses and Dr. Fisher come to tell him goodbye. He eventually goes to his mother's house in Henderson County, Kentucky, and there he is taking codeine and morphine to manage his pain. In his last diary entries in late July, he writes of wanting to return to Waverly Hills. According to his death certificate, he dies at the sanatorium on August 8th at the age of 33. There are some bigger points we can take from James' experience at Waverly Hills. The tragedy of people dying in the prime of their lives uh, was a very real consequence of tuberculosis which tended to infect young people more than other age groups. Uh, James notes the deaths of a handful of patients over the three years that he keeps his diaries, but he writes much more frequently about his feelings of boredom and despondency and about fellow patients' attempts to entertain themselves. Like many other patients, James was determined to seek care and fight for his health at Waverly Hills Sanatorium despite the hardships. Waiting lists at the institution remained long. They were filled not just with residents of Louisville and Jefferson County, but also with out-of-county and out-of-state residents trying to gain admission there. In the late 1920s, Waverly Hills tries to give preference to lifelong residents of the county and city first. Also, like many patients, James was desperate to get out of the sanatorium or at least to get a break from sanatorium life. There was nothing medical staff could do to force adult patients to remain at the sanatorium. Patients were supposed to get passes to leave, but there was no legal way to prevent them from simply leaving on their own, from staying home longer as James often did, or from never returning. One of my favorite tidbits from the book was from 1945, when the Waverly Hills superintendent complains about a quote, Mr. Uh, Mr. Garland Petard, unquote, who tended to repeatedly leave the sanatorium and come back drunk. 
But one thing that James doesn't write at all about in his diaries, um, he doesn't include any references to the hospital for black patients at Waverly Hills. Uh, the new sanatorium pictured here in the center of the photo, that new sanatorium where James lived exclusively housed white patients for all but the last several years of its 35 year existence as a tuberculosis sanatorium. It was not a foregone conclusion that when the new sanatorium opened, it would only house white patients. Officials heavily courted the support of black voters for that $750,000 municipal bond that passed in 1922. At Louisville's Public City Hospital, there were separate duplicate patient wings and medical and surgical facilities for white and black patients. The decision, however, was made at Waverly Hills to not have racially segregated wings in the new sanatorium, but rather to reserve all the beds for white patients. When the new sanatorium opened to white patients in 1926, that older hospital for advanced cases, pictured here in this image on the lower left, uh, that hospital became its separate division exclusively for black patients. The hospital was staffed with a black graduate nurse, Esther Behrens, whom I write about quite a bit in the book, and eventually by a black physician, Dr. Orville Ballard. Um, making Waverly Hills the first white-run medical institution in Kentucky to hire black medical professionals. The building quickly became severely overcrowded. As should be clear from this aerial view, uh, it lacked the many spaces and services available to white patients in that main sanatorium building. Uh, this is an image of, on the right, is that um, hospital is that old hospital for advanced cases that became a uh, hospital for black patients in 1926. On the left, and it's kind of a shadowy, it's not a great image, but on the left is the only image I have seen of the first addition uh, to the facilities for black patients, and that addition opened in 1933. The Waverly Hills Committee of the City Federation of Colored Women in Louisville worked for years with nurse Esther Behrens to get this new addition constructed. As I talk about in the book, an impressively long list of local black women's groups contributed to the care and comfort of adults and children treated in these facilities. The addition is a good example of how, even in the depths of the Great Depression, Waverly Hills continued to expand with the help of local support and funding. Uh, the number of children at Waverly Hills remained high during the 1930s. Uh, the Louisville Tuberculosis Association in the 30s ramped up its tuberculosis finding campaigns, and school children were regularly screened with tuberculin skin tests, then given an x-ray if they showed any uh, reaction to the skin test. If the x-ray showed indications of tuberculosis, or if children had been exposed to adults with tuberculosis in their household, or if their parents had been admitted to Waverly Hills, uh, those were all reasons that the children themselves could be admitted to the sanatorium. Since the late 19-teens, the majority of children housed at Waverly Hills were known as, quote, suspects. They were suspected of having tuberculosis, due to exposure in their families, but they had never tested positive for the disease or had clinical symptoms. I've had a number of people contact me about family members who, as children, were admitted to Waverly Hills Sanatorium, but who never had tuberculosis. While medical officials did not have the legal authority to force adults to be admitted to Waverly Hills or to stay at Waverly Hills, Public health officials in Louisville could use a court order to admit children to the sanatorium if those officials deem family members incapable of providing a proper home uh, to the children. Uh, the total average number of all patients per day at all the different facilities at Waverly Hills reached a high of 500 in 1937. Uh, with around 250 employees. This is a these are striking numbers considering widespread economic um, problems and widespread 
unemployment of the Great Depression. The last topic and period I want to talk about are the years during and after World War II, when a number of big changes happen at Waverly Hills. Uh, the first big shift happened in January 1942, when the Louisville um, Department of Health and the Jefferson County Board of Health merged, they combined, to form uh, the Louisville and Jefferson County Board of Health. At this point, they took over management of Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Uh, public officials, or some public officials, had long argued that since Waverly Hills is a public and publicly funded institution, it needed to be under the management and oversight of a public agency and not under uh, the oversight of the independent board of tuberculosis hospital. Uh, the Board of Health also oversaw the management of City Hospital, which they renamed Louisville General Hospital in 1942. In 1943, one of the Board of Health's first major actions at Waverly Hills was to increase the number of beds for Black patients, with the second edition pictured um, in the upper right of this slide. Uh, underneath the picture of that edition, um, um, is Dr. Orville Ballard standing there on the left. Again, he oversaw the care of black patients at Waverly Hill from 1928 when he started until its the closure of Waverly Hills in 1961. Um, another big change at Waverly Hills in the 1940s was a sharp curtailment of the admission of children. Uh, so much so that just one child was admitted in 1947. So again, a big shift uh, from earlier decades. In June of 1946, the Board of Health cut the number of beds at Waverly Hills from 500 to 400 uh, due to budget shortfalls. In October 1946, just a few months later, the Board of Health instituted a new pay policy at Waverly Hills. Uh, the previously free institution started charging patients for their treatment if they could afford it or if they had a newfangled thing called health insurance. Uh, this generated a lot of opposition and many patients in future years simply refused to pay, claiming they were already paying for the institution through their taxes. Uh, this is an exciting uh, graph or chart of the administrative structure at Waverly Hills in 1946. And I just wanted to talk about a few of the smaller, but what I think are pretty important squares here. Um, one on the lower left is the farm. In the years after World War II, a Waverly Hills doubled the size of its farm to 80 acres and revived its hog breeding program. Uh, both the farm and the hogs helped to provide fresh food and make money for the sanatorium amid rising food costs and meat shortages after World War II. The Waverly Hills hogs were cheap to raise. They were fed garbage from Waverly Hills as well as from Louisville General Hospital, and they brought up profits of up to $10,000 each year. Um, some other two squares I'd like to talk about is on the bottom right side, uh, occupational therapy and vocational training. Uh, these were two programs that Waverly Hills greatly expanded after World War II, both in the sanatorium for white patients and in the hospital for black patients. Uh, patients could learn their high school diplomas while at Waverly Hills. They could take typing classes, they could get vocational training, all of these programs received Louisville Tuberculosis Association funding. Uh, these are some of the patients who are helped by these programs. Rosetta Squires on the left uh, underwent two stays at the Hospital for Black Patients in the 1940s. While there, she took education classes and received practical nurse training. Uh, she became a practical nurse at Waverly Hills after she was discharged at, as a patient and her husband, also a former patient, uh, became an orderly there. In a Louisville Defender article from 1953, Rosetta said, quote, I like working at Waverly Hills because I feel that I understand people since I was once sick myself, unquote. 
Uh, Rosetta would go on to attend the Louisville General Hospital School of Nursing to become a registered nurse. Uh, Reverend Carl Ligon, uh, pictured here in the middle, also had two stays at the Hospital for Black Patients at Waverly Hills in 1950 and then later in 1953. Uh, in between, he attended Payne Theological Seminary in Ohio. His tuition was paid for by the Louisville Tuberculosis Association. Like Rosetta, Carl took classes at Waverly Hills and wanted to help patients there in return. In 1956, he told the Louisville Defender about his second stint at Waverly Hills, quote, I began teaching Sunday classes, Bible classes, and adult education classes for men who were interested in learning to read, write, and become better citizens, um, unquote. He was discharged from Waverly Hills in the spring of 1956, and he went on to establish the Newburgh Community House and an AME mission. Uh, the third photo here features some young male patients participating in a rehabilitative program um, in which they are decorating the main sanatorium for the Yuletide season. One of my favorite stories from the book uh, was about a group of men enrolled in the home economics program offered at the main sanatorium during the 1950s. Uh, those men were learning to whip up cupcakes with coconut frosting so they could help their working wives once they uh, got back home. Uh, Waverly Hills is dealing with severe staff shortages after World War II. Uh, the institution tried to recruit nurses and physicians and other staff from nursing and medical schools from other countries um, and by training former patients as they did with Rosetta Squires. In 1947, the Board of Health uh, launched a new partnership with Meharry Medical School, which was a historically black medical school in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, they wanted to try to alleviate the shortage of physicians at Waverly Hills and also address the shortage of black physicians in Louisville. Meharry agreed to send medical students to Waverly Hills for month long training sessions. Uh, Dr. Grace M. J James, pictured here on the left, is a well, was a well-known Louisville physician. Uh, there's a JCPS school named after her uh, today. She and Waverly Hills physician Dr. Orville Ballard were the first Black physicians to be appointed to the faculty of the University of Louisville Medical School. Born in Virginia, Dr. James graduated from Meharry Medical School in 1950. She did her residency and earned a clinical fellowship in New York City. Uh, and then she moved to Louisville in 1953. What is always left out of online biographies about her is something I found out by reading through issues of the Louisville Defender. She first came to Louisville when she was a medical student to complete a training at Waverly Hills Sanatorium. It was then that she was first introduced to Louisville um, and it's then that she decided she would move back to Louisville after her residency in New York City. Uh, Dr. William Moses, pictured here in the middle, was born in Georgia, and he also graduated from Meharry Medical School, and he graduated in 1949. He became the first Black certified surgeon in Kentucky. According to the Louisville Defender, like Dr. James, he was introduced to Louisville while a Meharry Medical student participating in the Waverly Hills training program. He said he really liked the city and he moved here in 1959, joining the medical staff at several local hospitals. Dr. Jesse Bell here on the right uh, was a graduate of Meharry Medical School who came to Louisville in 1935 to work at Waverly Hills Sanatorium, where he remained until 1947. Uh, Dr. Bell worked also worked for over 20 years with the Louisville Jefferson County Board of Health. And he became the first black doctor at Louisville's Jewish Hospital in 1958. Uh, there's a wonderful photo in the Louisville Defender from 1964 of a dinner hosted by Dr. Bell and his wife, Geneva Bell, for formal, former employees who had worked at Waverly Hills for 30 years. Uh, the photo unfortunately was not of high enough quality to reproduce here, but it is a testament to the strong community of employees at the Black Hospital at Waverly Hills. 
According to Louisville physician and medical historian, Dr. Morris Weiss Jr., Dr. Bell was the first to receive the new antibiotic streptomycin at Waverly Hills at the end of World War II. Uh, people had high hopes for streptomycin, but many tuberculosis patients had negative reactions to it or developed a resistance to it. Uh, Waverly Hills, like other tuberculosis sanatoriums, participated in the development of an effective multi-drug treatment during the late 1940s and early 1950s. And this multi-drug treatment eventually combined streptomycin with other newly uh, developed pharmaceutical drugs like isoniazid and PAS. Now, starting in 1956, multi-drug treatments were given on an extended outpatient basis to a growing number of patients. And this marked the first time we see a steady decline in the number of patients at Waverly Hills. Uh, this brings us to our last photo. This is from May of 1960, and you can see it's a sparsely populated um, sun porch of the main sanatorium at Waverly Hills. In the fall of 1959, Waverly Hills had 280 of its 400 beds filled. It had 22 buildings still on 400, I'm sorry, on 544 acres. Uh, by the end of 1949, the Kentucky State Tuberculosis Hospital Commission had agreed to take over care of Waverly Hills patients. The state agency, however, already managed another tuberculosis sanatorium in Jefferson County, Hazelwood Sanatorium, which I mentioned at the beginning of this talk as a private sanatorium established by the Louisville Tuberculosis Association. It was taken over by the state in 1920. Uh, once the state agreed to take over Waverly Hills Sanatorium patients, it soon announced that it would close Waverly Hills and move the patients to a renovated Hazelwood Sanatorium. Local residents and former patients and current employees all fought hard to keep Waverly Hills open, but the last patient, patients were transferred out in June of 1961. A Hazelwood itself would close just 10 years later in 1971. The closure of Waverly Hills Sanatori Sanatorium marked the end of an era, not just for the patients and employees of Waverly Hills. The rise and growth and last years of Waverly Hills represent a significant chapter in the history of Louisville and Jefferson County and for modern medicine. Uh, Waverly Hills, in my opinion, was a quintessential public institution, widely supported by many local people who pushed for free treatment and expanded facilities and services for all patients. It was a racially segregated institution that became the first Kentucky public uh, medical institution to employ black medical professionals. And it brought and recruited a number of notable black physicians to Louisville. The connection of so many people to Waverly Hills helps to explain why this massive sprawling complex was created for the treatment of a single disease. It helps to explain why the sanatorium building still standing today was constructed and why it has not been demolished. It is my hope that this historic structure serves as a physically powerful way to tell the stories of the many different facilities of Waverly Hills Sanatorium and the many people who fought for health in the face of one of history's most devastating and deadly diseases. Uh, so thank you for your time and for listening. I am going to, I think I'm supposed to hand back control. Thank you so much, Ellen. Really great job. And, um, yeah, I will take back the slides here. Let's see here. All right, here we go. Um, fascinating learning about James Gabhart too. That, I mean, oh, just yeah. the, it really kind of brings it um, to a personal level to actually hear like what he was experiencing. I mean, to see his diary, that just, blew my mind. So um, thank you so much.
Um, all right, folks, if you've got questions for Lynn, just enter them in the question section on GoToWebinar. Um, and uh, before we go to questions, we do have some door prizes. So tonight we're gonna be giving away um, some copies of Lynn's book. Um, if you are one of the lucky winners, you will receive the book via Amazon. Uh, and we're also gonna be giving away one of our cup of genealogy, one of our mugs from off of our uh, merchandise uh, store through the website. So um, what we're gonna do to make it easy is we're gonna go with um, who arrived first tonight. So based upon arrival times, um, the first four folks who arrived were, um, first was Deb Atland, Shannon Compton, June Douglas, and Mary Perry. So Deb, Shannon, and June, you've won a copy of Lynn's book. And Mary, you have won um, a cup of genealogy. So congratulations to the four of you. I believe you're all members. Um, so we do have your uh, addresses on file. In case you're not, if you wanna enter your address in the um, chat, we'll make sure that you get um, your door prize mailed to you. Okay, uh, let's see, we've got questions coming in. Um, So Dr. Rhonda Wells, uh, Lynn, is asking, um, how would you find out where a relative went? She was 12 in 1934, a pauper from Perry County. How would you find out where she went? Yeah. As in what sanatorium she would have been treated? Yeah, Rhonda, that's a bit unclear. Can you kind of clarify? Uh, She's asking, so tonight we focus, Rhonda, on Waverly Hills. Um, I put in the chat for anyone who's interested in the broader uh, Kentucky ecosystem of institutions, a website, which is kyhi.org. There are a lot of institutions throughout the Commonwealth. So, um, Lynn, I don't know if you want to expand on that, but tonight we're just focusing on Waverly Hills. Yeah, there were, um, there were a number of private institutions across Kentucky. Lexington had a few public um, sanatoriums. And then after World War II, that state uh, tuberculosis um, commission that I talked about actually built um, five more sanatoriums. So Hazelwood was one of those um, that had existed beforehand, but there was a big investment, public investment across Kentucky after World War II, but I know you were talking, your relative was there in 1938, I think is what you mentioned. So if she was in a rural area, it would be pretty unlikely that she would have a sanatorium accessible to her, especially one like Waverly Hills that would have provided uh, free treatment. And that is why Waverly's always had this long waiting list and a big push from people outside the county and outside the state um, trying to get there because it was such a reputable institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, Dr. Wells, you wanna check out that K kyhi.org. That is a website that has a list of all the different institutions. They're all over the Commonwealth. That's uh, like Kentucky Historic Institutions. Yeah, yeah. it's there, a good it's, open. It is a good, it's, it's all medical, mostly medical institutions, so yeah. Yeah, and as I shared with Lynn, uh, I didn't know anything about family members that I had at Waverly Hills until I saw it on their death certificate. So, you know, oftentimes that's that. Um, I mean, I found lots of people that were on, uh, they died at Waverly Hills or they died at Lakeland. That's another one. Um, you know, um, there's one in Christian County you see frequently. It's, I think, actually maybe still open. Um, so, uh, Lynn, what uh, questions coming in? Just what other uh, facilities have you researched in the in the health space? What other? What did you say? What other? What other facilities in in health have you researched? People were just. Um, in well, my background academically was in the deep south, and I actually did rural and small town medicine. So, like doctors treating patients in the late. 1800s and early 1900s still in patients' homes. So, so a lot of my background was in this very decentralized um, rural ways of giving care, which I was just 
fascinated with and the slow transition away from that where physicians began establishing medical offices and connecting themselves to hospitals and in a lot of ways leaving rural communities behind and we still have that crisis we face today. Um, so that's my background and it wasn't until moving to Louisville in, oh my goodness, 2006, so I'm just a transplant here, that I began to really focus on the urban context of medicine. And um, probably the most fascinating institution to me here is City Hospital, because it's gone through so many manifestations. Um, after becoming Louisville General Hospital, it was later taken over by University of Louisville in the 70s and is well, I guess today U of L Health, um, but was commonly called University Hospital. So um, I would love to do more work on Central and Eastern State um, Hospital, the hospitals for the treatment of mental illness. Um, but again, patient records, first of all, are either hard to find or for good reasons are not accessible um, to medical researchers. Um, but I think there's a lot of history still to be written on those institutions in particular. Yeah, we had several questions come in about patient records, uh, which you mentioned actually at the start of your talk in terms of um, what exists for Waverly Hills. But yeah. um, can you just, for folks who maybe aren't familiar, can you just briefly elaborate on why these records are not easily accessible. Okay, just in general, medical. Well, so first off, for Waverly Hills, again, went a lot, and I understand this, that a lot of those records, patient records, were stored again at, a, at the Waverly, Waverly Hills Clinic downtown, destroyed in the flood of 1937. But I'm less clear about what happened to patient and medical records after that. Um, and again, as I talked about, the Board of Health took over this institution. So I was able to access all the Board of Health minutes downtown um, in Louisville, but I pushed and talked to so many people to find out where other records were. Um, it really frustrates me that they, it, as the public institution, more of these records were not preserved, um, especially for family members who are so desperately trying to track down um, loved ones who were treated there in the first half of the century. Uh, but HIPAA, uh, which was passed um, in the 1990s, early 1990s, I think, that um, does not allow, usually does not allow access to medical records. And it's something like for 50 years after the point a person has been treated and they, it has to be after their death. And it's a hard process to go through even for a family member to try to access um, their family member's medical records. So there's a lot of federal laws um, governing privacy for medical records, which again, this isn't a bad thing. It does prevent some research <laughs> being done history-wise into medical records. But again, there's a period of time when these records will become open. And if you are a family member, you can make a case for opening these records. But mm. unfortunately for the case of Waverly Hills, I'm not entirely convinced they don't exist at all, but they don't seem to exist, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yes. And uh, that, you know, that goes for a lot of, um, institutional records in Kentucky. Uh, I've tried finding records for someone who was um, in a reform school in Lexington, and I went through sort of a in-depth process with the Kentucky Department of Library and Archives. And because they were a minor, you just can't access those records. Right, right. They may right. have them, but you're not going to be able to access them. So, yeah. But it makes sense if they at some point do <laughs> tell that time, you know, after a certain amount of time has elapsed, but still that doesn't help you trying to do your research, so yeah. Yeah, I think I think for most researchers, they'll find a death certificate or a census record, and then they wanna find more, and yeah, that's where, yeah. It, you know, yeah. All right, um, any other questions we have for Lynn this evening? Now let's see here, uh, right, yeah, just lots of folks sharing their frustration over records, medical records, uh, yeah. Um, here's a good question, Lynn. Um, what is the building used for now? 
Uh, well, if you, yeah, you must not be from Louisville. <laughs> because you're from Louisville, you know it's pretty notorious now as a, uh, I they call themselves a historic or tour site, um, and it's called Waverly Hill Sanatorium. And they conduct public tours of the facility as well as like overnight paranormal investigations. Um, so I, in the spring of 2019, did the public historical tour of the facility. And it really was, I thought it was an amazing experience. It was like walking through this physical artifact um, and the building is deteriorating. Like it's a lot, you know, it's an old <laughs> building. Uh, almost 100 years old that requires a lot of maintenance. Um, and it was pretty incredible to see those spaces. And I thought my tour guide that day was very respectful. Um, he still talked about ghosts a lot and showed photos, um, but he did talk about some of the, you know, what history they did know um, to a degree. And so it was well, well worth going to. It had in incredible views on the top of the roof um, of the surrounding area, um, but they make their money, especially from paranormal investigations, from their events, um, like their haunted house every year. Um, and it's a hard thing for me as a historian to kind of um, really say whether, you know, what parts of this is good and not um, because this building would have never survived had it not been bought um, by the people who own it now and turned into this paranormal site in a way. I don't think it would survive as a history museum. Um, but again, I really do. And I think they have been moving in this direction to really try to tell um, some of the real history of the different facilities that are a part of Waverly Hills. Um, but you also hear very wildly exaggerated numbers of people who died there. Um, which are not rooted in any documentation or fact. And I address that in the conclusion of my book um, to give a little bit better estimate of what we know about how people died there and how that was different for different pe periods of time at the, at the institution. Yeah, long before I did any research and knew anything about family members dying there, uh, about uh, 2000, Two, I was living in Chicago and I was in Louisville visiting a friend and they said, oh, I've got tickets to go spend the night in this haunted place. Do you want to go with me? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I was young. I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? So I ended up spending the night in Waverly Hills 20 oh, years what? ago. Yeah. <laughs> before I knew about any of this stuff. So um, and to your point, it was lots of ghost stories. <laughs> yeah, well, and there's definitely something to be written. I mean, someone can write something about just the cultural phenomenon of it becoming, you know, this famous place for paranormal investigation and ghost hunting. And I think it's fascinating that I talked to so many people who grew up in South Louisville and they're all say, you know, in the 80s and 90s, when it was abandoned, they're like, yeah, we hung out there all the time. There's this whole teenage, young adult culture there for that part of town that I think is just so fascinating, so. Elizabeth, do you have any questions for uh, Lynn? Yeah, I was, um, I was struck by the fact that, if I'm getting the dates on your book right, you were probably researching and writing about this during the pandemic. Yes. And I was wondering how those two things resonated with each other, because again, sort of, you know, diseases that were feared and not well understood. And I'm just curious oh. what the experience was like. Yeah, it absolutely resonated. Like everything from reading about, you know, it's such a, it was such a huge public health endeavor to create this institution and to compare, you know, this idea of like, children being hospitalized there either with their sick parents or without them and the lengths that they went to um, and that that big emphasis put on fresh air and ventilation um, which again had renewed <laughs> renewed um, emphasis uh, during COVID there were just so many points um, that that we're eerily uh, similar and I say that at the end we're not you know living in altogether 
different times from what a lot of these people are going through, um, that a lot of these epidemics are going to be, are hard, they're always hard to manage, and we have very different responses to them. Um, but it was a good, a good project to have during COVID as well as I was at home um, and able to research. I was also wondering how far away from just pure randomness the treatments at this place were because they sound gruesome and they also to my you know sort of modern mind don't sound like they would work well i mean so the and again the treatment of fresh air and trying to build up um build up patients weight and strength through these i mean very protein heavy diets of like egg yolks and 12 glasses of milk a day and um, sometimes with enemas, just anything you have to do to get, you know, protein and fat in these patients' bodies. So I understand to me, all of that makes a lot of sense, uh, especially the fresh air part, uh, you know, that they're, that's what they're learning about how to manage this disease. Uh, the surgeries, um, and again, the surgeries at the time made sense and are still, you know, that is a treatment for tuberculosis is that you want the lung, the diseased lung to recover. And to do that, you don't want the bacteria to keep multiplying and to spread to other parts of the body as well. And so they definitely took the surgeries in a, a pretty radical direction by the 1940s and 50s. Um, and even 30s, they were doing this by removing ribs. But it really is by the 50s when they were removing like diseased parts of the lung. I mean, that was one of the most effective things you could do before you had that effective multi-drug treatment. Um, and multi-drug treatments for tuberculosis today are causing, uh, there's a whole resurgence in tuberculosis um, that's resistant uh, to multi-drug treatments because these treatments are supposed to be given over a period of many months. And if you don't keep up the treatment as a patient on an outpatient basis, then again, you're just killing off the weaker <laughs> the bacteria and letting the more hardy um, one survive. And so, you know, treatment's a hard thing still today and was definitely, uh, you know, I think doctors are really just trying to do whatever they could to make an impact and help these patients recover, but absolutely could carry that to extremes um, with bad consequences. Well, Lynn, thank you so much again for um, sharing Waverly Hills history with us this evening. Um, just a fascinating story. Thank you for um, uh, talking to the society. This uh, program was recorded and um, we do have a little bit of housekeeping on the tail end, but Lynn, thank you again. And um, uh, if folks do want to get your book, where, can, where do you recommend they get it from? Amazon or? Yeah, Amazon, or if you're here locally at Carmichael's, our local bookstore, um, Barnes and Noble, or from Arcadia Press itself, the history, the history press. But Amazon's always the most easiest. So yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Elizabeth. Much. Thank you. And Thank folks, you. Oh, I got a cat. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Uh, just before we wrap up tonight, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, just a reminder of some of our upcoming programs. We've got John Grenham, a two part series on Irish research that's March 3rd and the 11th. It's uh, for both of those, it's at 10 a.m. Now, these two parts will be recorded. Uh, they'll be available for you to access in the member archive uh, after the program. We often get the question from new members, will this webinar be recorded? You know, just so folks know, kind of uh, our baseline is we record all of our webinars. Uh, if the speaker won't allow us to record, we typically don't have them speak to the society. Um, on rare exceptions, but most of our speakers, we record everything. So um, that's part of the agreement for speaking to our society. So these two will be available in the member archive uh, once they're over in case you can't reach, uh, participate in the lives. Um, also, uh, if you register for one, you register for both of them. So there's not, it's not two different um, registrations, it's one registration. 
So that's March 3rd and the 11th. Uh, John Granham's probably the best Irish researcher in the world, so I'm looking forward to that um, two-part series. Um, and then we have James Tanner coming back. He's going to be doing uh, new technologies that will aid you in your Kentucky uh, research. And uh, he is really excited about doing this talk for the society. I was talking to him about it, and he's going to be incorporating um, some innovations that are being launched at uh, Roots Tech, um, which is coming up here before long. Hopefully, you all register for Roots Tech. The virtual Roots Tech is free. Um, it is put on by Family Search. It's a wonderful uh, uh, platform for learning. Lots of different free webinars you can access and participate in. And uh, if you've never participated, I uh, just want to encourage you to do so because, like I said, it is a free uh, virtual offering. You can learn more about it at FamilySearch.org. And the most exciting thing I think uh, part of Roots Tech is they have this, um, if you download their app, you can find relatives at Roots Tech. And um, I'm registered and I just was notified today, I have over 13,759 of my cousins have joined. And what is neat about it is you can view um, your relatives that have registered and you can view actually how they're related to you, which is pretty fascinating. Um, I learned just the other day that met, uh, Betty Milburn, who is, uh, or not Betty Milburn, what am I saying? Um, uh, who did I learn? Uh, one of our members is a, a cousin of mine, and I'm trying to find out who it is. I just found them. Anyway, um, if you haven't registered, register for Roots Tech. It's free, and make sure you sign up for the relatives at Roots Tech so you can learn about all the uh, interesting cousins that you have that you probably didn't know about. Um, that's a really fun uh, way to um, interact with uh, other descendants that may be researching the same lines that you're researching. But James is going to pull all the insights from Roots Tech together in case you're not able to attend that, and he'll be sharing um, some of the new technology that's available. There's some like fascinating technology that's at work that um, uh, he's excited to share with us. Um, we have Melissa Barker coming on March 23rd. She's going to be talking to us about digging into finding aids. Uh, if you're doing any sort of genealogical research in Kentucky, you need to be very familiar with the archive landscape. Uh, and if you are doing research in an archive, you need to understand manuscripts and you need to understand finding aids. So if those terms are all sort of new to you, you want to make sure you're attending Melissa's talk on the 23rd. Uh, she'll be talking about archives. She'll be talking about manuscripts. She'll be talking about finding aids. Again, these are all really important uh, for any researcher um, to learn about their Kentucky ancestors. The vast majority of Kentucky records are not online. They're not on Ancestry. They're not on Family Search. They're sitting on shelves in archives. Um, and record repositories. So you, you really have to understand that to um, find out more about your ancestors. Um, and then we've got Faye Stallings. Faye is the president for the Board of Certification of Genealogists, uh, which is sort of the credentialing um, branch of the genealogy ecosystem. Uh, she's going to be doing a talk for us on um, it, follow the GPS. It will not steer you uh, in the wrong direction. Uh, the GPS uh, uh, being the um, um, uh, genealogical proof standard, how that applies to your research. Uh, Faye is a sixth generation Kentuckian, and she's going to be sharing a case study from, uh, uh, I believe, Bowling Green. So that should be a really exciting webinar. I believe it's um, a Kentucky ancestor of hers that is uh, from North Carolina into Kentucky. So um, she might, if you have ancestors that came from North Carolina into Kentucky, that, there might be some insights in that too um, that could be valuable to you. Faye's awesome, and um, we're really looking forward to her talk. I will close with just letting you know we love new members. So thank you all for being members. Uh, this is a volunteer organization. We're completely grassroots. We have no building, uh, we have, we're all virtual. Uh, we get no funding from the state. There are no employees. Everything that gets accomplished in our society is accomplished through the kindness of our volunteer members. 
Uh, we have a lot of folks who are members, very few that actually volunteer. So if you are a volunteer, thank you so much. Uh, the volunteers are what kind of make all this go and we really appreciate everyone who does volunteer. If you would like to volunteer, there's always an open invitation. You can go to kygs.org slash volunteer or you can drop uh, me an email and um, we'll try to connect you with a role that matches your strengths and talents. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Elizabeth, for co-hosting this evening. Anything you want to share before we wrap up? No, just it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And uh, Elizabeth is going to be co-hosting um, a lot of our webinars uh, going forward. Uh, M Melissa and I will, will sort of be uh, partnering with either Elizabeth or uh, some of us may kind of, uh, you know, take a break here and there because um, it is nice having Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, I cannot thank you enough for just coming out of the blue and volunteering to help. So um, that's how this works. And um, we love it when people actually raise their hand and say, yes, I want to volunteer. I don't want to just be a uh, just someone who participates. I actually want to like actively volunteer and help out. So thank you so much, Elizabeth. And hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you and take care. Bye bye. Night.